We uh, have always got along fine with the niggas. We never mistreated them. And there's no complaints. And they are all happy. They are all happy. Asking with the Panthers. We was asking with them. You know, civil rights movement. We was asking. You know, now, now those people that were asking, they're all dead and in jail. So now what do you think we're going to do? Ask. If you don't break the cycle, history repeats. If you don't crash the system, it reboots. If you don't eliminate the virus, it thrives. This is the algorithm of white supremacy. An algorithm is a list of steps followed to finish a task. The task or objective of white supremacy has always been the same, domination. Rather, your present is 1619, 1775, 1863, 1968, 2020, or 100 years in the future. If this algorithm has not been ended, then its goal will remain the same. Despite the rising and falling of nations and institutions, the algorithm of white supremacy's reach is global. Its history is evil, and its effects have been injected deeply into the present. Focus your senses. Open your eyes, ignore all distractions, and upload this information into your mind. Jesus Christ, do you think he'd really agree with what you devils did? I thought he said, without love you have nothing. Are you sure we are looking in the same book? The Supreme Pontiff, commonly known as the Pope, is the worldwide leader of the Catholic Church. He determines what is acceptable for millions of people worldwide. His words and decrees are taken as the word of God. He is believed to be free of error. This is called papal infallibility. In 1452, Pope Nicholas V issued a papal bull known as Dum Diversus. A papal bull is an official proclamation or decree issued by the Pope. With his words being seen as that of gods, Pope Nicholas issued Dum Diversus, which had a disastrous effect on Africa. In the 1400s, there were laws clearly regulating who Christians could and could not enslave. When Portuguese ships began returning with slaves from West Africa, Pope Nicholas V addressed the issue of how to treat what he referred to as pagans. He gave King Alfonso of Portugal the right to invade, search out, capture, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ wheresoever placed, and the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Let's put that in other words. The Pope gave a European king the right to invade in Jesus' name, conquer in Jesus' name, steal in Jesus' name, and enslave in Jesus' name. Yet the man believed to be Jesus' representative on earth, a man whose words are put on par with that of God's, a man believed to be free of error, the most holy living being on the planet, was actually the devil, and may his name rot in the bowels of history forever. In Jesus' name. After the hunt, it is not the prey who authors the story, but the hunters. Rest assured that the authors will justify all of their murderous ways and forgive themselves for their prey's destruction. And as the survivors scramble, attempting to rebuild their former lives, the hunters will do all they can to silence them. Devil.
A long line of justifications led Europe to perpetrate one of the worst atrocities ever, the transatlantic slave trade. Even to this day, people attempt to justify the slave trade by saying that European slave traders purchased slaves from Africans. They'll go just far enough into the past to blame the oppression of black people on black people. Yet the truth is more complex than they can handle. There is bound to be some snakes in every group of people. European slave traders took advantage of this for their own benefit at the cost of countless black lives. Although some Africans participated in the slave trade, many fought against it, building fortifications around their villages and assigning lookouts to alert the people. The fight continued aboard the ship in the form of rebellions, hunger strikes, and even suicide. The transatlantic slave trade haunted the people of Africa, and they fought against it. Africans also did not view the slave trade as selling their own people, as they did not have a united black identity, as some people ignorantly suggest when they say that Africans sold their own people into slavery. Africans were not united. The Europeans were the ones who were united. They were united in their desire to have black slaves. Slavery wasn't new, but what the Europeans brought to it was a deeply racial connotation justified by their highest religious official, the Pope. It was the Europeans who created, ran, and heavily benefited from the intricately complex and economically lucrative system of the transatlantic slave trade. A symphony of sorrow and death, the longest forced movement of people ever recorded, spanning centuries. Hundreds of bodies would be packed together tightly, chained to the bottom of a ship. Initially, merchant ships were modified for use in the slave trade. In time, they began building ships specifically to carry slaves on. There wasn't enough space to stand, and the air was foul as people lay dead, scared, and alone in their own bodily wastes. This was the Middle Passage. Traders bought Africans with European goods and took them from West Africa across the Atlantic Ocean to what the Europeans called the New World. Some estimates say that 10 to 15% of Africans died during the voyage, which lasted nearly three months. The survivors were sold as slaves and returned for goods such as sugar, rum and molasses and the slave traders turned around and went back to europe to start the journey over again and they hail western civilization as the pinnacle of humanity when indeed it seems to be the pinnacle of inhumanity there was no age of exploration there was no beauty in european colonization the story of the American colonies is not some patriotic dream where America's manifest destiny was fulfilled. This was an invasion, a story all about benefiting from death, genocide, and perpetual servitude, causing problems and ignoring their effects even till this day. When we mention what happened, you look in the other direction. This evil was carried out against our people, we say. But you say, blacks sold other blacks. It lasted centuries, we say. But you say, it was a long time ago. It still has effects today, we say. But you say, you were never a slave and I was never a slave owner. This is the algorithm of white supremacy. They always ignore, attack, or deny. If you don't break the cycle, history repeats. If you don't crash the system, it reboots. <laughs> African, and we happen to be in America. We're not American. We are people who formerly were Africans who were kidnapped and brought to America. Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. We were brought here against our will. We were not brought here to be made citizens. We are African, and we happen to be in America. We're not American. We are people who formerly were Africans who were kidnapped and brought to America. Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. 
We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. We were brought here against our will. We were not brought here to be made citizens. Because we weren't brought here to be made citizens today, now that we've become awakened to some degree and we begin to ask for those things which they say are supposedly for Americans, they look upon us with hostility and unfriendliness. We invested 310 years of slave labor, 310 years, every day of which you and my mother and father worked for nothing. Not eight hours a day. There was no union in that day. They worked from sun up until sundown, from can't see in the morning until can't see at night. They never had a day off. And on Sunday, they were allowed to sit down and sing about when they die, they wouldn't be slaves no more. When they die. When they die. 1619, the year believed to have marked the first arrival of Africans in the colony of Virginia. In actuality, captive Africans were present in what would become the United States for over a hundred years before 1619 as the European trade of Africans began in the mid-1400s. Throughout the years, many have claimed that the first slave ship was named Jesus. Although claiming a first slave ship is difficult, it is true that the first major English trader did use a boat named Jesus of Lubeck. John Hawkins was said to have been a devout Christian often holding service on board and telling his crew to serve God and love one another, all while plundering ships, stealing slaves, and lying to Africans to lure them to the New World. Africans entered into this New World, a new world that Europe granted itself access to by invading, spreading disease, killing natives, and continually breaking treaties. They were sold at slave auctions, inspected like cattle, having their mouths pried open, their muscles squeezed, their bodies violated, separated from families, and brought to a place unfamiliar to them, a place to build a world for those who had destroyed theirs. What happens when you subjugate a group of people to the lowest levels of society? The people will always fight their oppressor. But many make the ignorant claim that enslaved people in America did not fight back, but rather waited for the North to end slavery. They never heard of the Stono Rebellion of 1739, the German Coast Uprising of 1811, or Nat Turner's Rebellion. But the slave owners had heard of these, and they were fearful of being killed in uprisings. In order to calm their fears, laws regulating the actions and treatment of slaves, known as slave codes, were written into law. Enslaved people had to have written permission from their overseer to travel, and if they attempted to run, they could be branded with an R on their cheek, have their hamstrings cut, or be killed. Blacks were prohibited from owning weapons, and if they were caught doing so, they would receive 39 lashes and have their weapon confiscated. If an enslaved person attempted to defend themselves from their master, the slaveholder had the right to kill them. Enslaved people were considered property, so they were prohibited from owning property. Blacks accused of any crime against a white person were sentenced to death by all white juries. There were even laws punishing whites if they attempted to help enslaved people. It was illegal for slaves to read and write. Anyone caught teaching them how to do so was subject to large fines and up to six months in jail. They were also prohibited from congregating due to the fear of them organizing to fight against their own oppression. If a black man was accused of raping a white woman, he would be castrated or executed, all while the bodies of enslaved women were free to be violated without repercussion. Children born to enslaved women were born as slaves and in most cases died as slaves. But you, dear listener, were never a slave. This has no effect on the present, or at least that's what they'd like you to believe. We are playing an infinite game of dominoes, 
Not the type that you slam on the table when you win. The type that children often play when they carefully stack dominoes up on their ends, making a long winding line of dotted tiles. If done carefully enough, tipping over the first tile will cause a chain reaction that will cause the next to fall, and the next, and so forth, until the final tile falls. Now once they all fall, what reasonable human would suggest that the falling of the first tile had nothing to do with the falling of the last? How is it that they can trace their dominoes all the way back to the pilgrims and identify that as a monumental moment that shaped their history, but they can't seem to understand how slavery monumentally shaped black history? Because you were never a slave. It is all by design. The algorithm of white supremacy must deny all attempts to crash the system. The American Revolution, the war fought by the 13 colonies to free themselves from the British Empire, a pivotal moment where the Founding Fathers forged their way into history forever. According to your history teacher, the American Revolution is essentially a patriotic dream where heroes were born and the destiny of a nation was set. Give me liberty or give me death. What is liberty to this man? What liberty was Patrick Henry so ready to die for that he denied it to others? A giant among men, this revolutionary founding father bought and sold slaves throughout his life and owned 67 slaves at the time of his death. Yet in his writings, he clearly states that owning slaves is evil. What a hypocrite. But he was in good company. Thomas Jefferson, one of the most influential founding fathers to come out of the revolution, the man who penned the Declaration of Independence, in which the colonists informed King George of their decision to split from the British Empire, leading to the creation of the United States, the man who wrote the immortal words forever etched in history. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if all men are created equally, then why did Thomas Jefferson himself have slaves? Why did he have a sexual relationship with an underaged enslaved woman by the name of Sally Hemings? Something that today we would call statutory rape. Did he really believe that all men were created equally? Such beautiful words inspired many blacks to join the fight against the British. Around 9,000 black men fought for the Continental Army many of which were promised their freedom in return for their service, although at the end of the war a number of slave owners failed to keep their promise. In contrast to the 9,000 blacks fighting for the colonies, 20,000 enslaved people fought for the British Army, who also had promised them freedom. Yet, at the end of the war, many of them were enslaved by the very men who had filled their heads with false promises, as they fled the colonies to become slaves in Jamaica or St. Augustine. Africans fighting against the United States was revisited during the War of 1812, in which the United States fought and defeated Great Britain once again. America's national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, was written by Francis Scott Key during the War of 1812. It was initially a poem called Defense of Fort McHenry. Key had written it as he witnessed the British Navy bombard the fort in what would lead to an American victory and the proud flying of the U.S. flag. In the third stanza of the Star Spangled Banner, Key addresses the black refugees who had joined the British in hopes of gaining their freedom, threatening slaves that fought against the United States with death, writing, No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. We're proud of our country. We respect our flag. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners? 
inspired many blacks to join the fight against the British. Around 9,000 black men fought for the Continental Army, many of which were promised their freedom in return for their service, although at the end of the war, a number of slave owners failed to keep their promise. In contrast to the 9,000 blacks fighting for the colonies, 20,000 enslaved people fought for the British Army, who also had promised them freedom. Yet, at the end of the war, many of them were enslaved by the very men who had filled their heads with false promises as they fled the colonies to become slaves in Jamaica or St. Augustine. Africans fighting against the United States was revisited during the War of 1812, in which the United States fought and defeated Great Britain once again. America's national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, was written by Francis Scott Key during the War of 1812. It was initially a poem called Defense of Fort McHenry. Key had written it as he witnessed the British Navy bombard the fort in what would lead to an American victory and the proud flying of the U.S. flag. In the third stanza of the Star Spangled Banner, Key addresses the black refugees who had joined the British in hopes of gaining their freedom, threatening slaves that fought against the United States with death, writing, No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. We're proud of our country. We respect our flag. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now, out, he's fired. He's fired! I mean, ultimately, it's to bring awareness and make people, you know, realize what's really going on in this country. There are a lot of things that are going on that are unjust, people aren't being held accountable for, and that's something that needs to change. That's something that you know, this country stands for freedom, liberty, justice for all. And it's not happening for all right now. Get that son of a bitch off the field right now. The American Civil War. Nearly a century had passed since Thomas Jefferson had written the Declaration of Independence and the United States continually failed at living up to its promises of freedom and equality. Enter Abraham Lincoln, another monumental figure in American history. According to your history teacher, Lincoln was a savior for the black community, a selfless man who gave his life fighting to abolish slavery. Lincoln emerges as a benevolent hero the Civil War is often used to silence black voices and ignore the effects of our history. People say there was an entire war fought to free the slaves. People died to set your ancestors free. What we should be asking is why did it take America centuries to wake up to the evils of slavery and why were Americans still willing to die to preserve it? The Confederate States of America were formed after Lincoln became president in fear that he would bring slavery to an end. But the truth is, Lincoln was not an abolitionist. Abolitionists believed that slavery should be ended immediately. While Lincoln viewed slavery as a moral wrong, he did not seek to bring it to an end. During the peak of the Civil War, in his own words, Lincoln wrote, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. In other words, although Lincoln thought slavery was morally wrong, his primary goal was keeping the United States together, regardless of whether slavery was abolished or not. The Emancipation Proclamation is commonly believed to have abolished slavery. This is not true. Many who believe so most likely have never actually read the document itself. The Emancipation Proclamation was a military measure taken by President Lincoln to destabilize the South and rally escaped slaves to fight for the Union. Lincoln writes, I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. 
the proclamation only applied to states that were in rebellion. This was an attempt to destabilize the South from within. This doesn't mean that the Emancipation Proclamation was not an important document or that it did not help lead to full abolition. Lincoln's participation in the eventual abolition of slavery and his tragic assassination at the end of the Civil War propelled him into sainthood. But how did a man known as the Great Emancipator really feel about black people? These are words from his own mouth. I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of white and black races. I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. While they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. I do not understand the belief that because I do not want a Negro woman for a slave that I must necessarily want her for a wife. Those aren't the quotes you'll see etched in stone around the Lincoln Memorial. Lincoln believed that free slaves should be sent to either Africa or Central America. He even attempted to get support for his plan prior to writing the Emancipation Proclamation on the basis that whites and blacks could not live together peacefully. Stop and digest this information. Why am I telling you this? Remember the algorithm. If you don't crash the system, it reboots. And Abraham Lincoln showed us how the system works. Even one of the most influential individuals who played a major role in the abolition of slavery was racist. The system of white supremacy took a deep blow when slavery ended. Yet the system was immediately rebooting in the minds of those who helped deliver the blow. Lincoln is a picture of many white northerners who believed slavery to be wrong but also did not believe in true equality for blacks. How are we to view the individuals who gave with one hand and took with the other? Every time black people are freed from a system of oppression, a new one is created in an instance. Man, the cleaning man, the pole man, the shoe shine man, I'm a nigger man, watch me dance. Yeah, I got the devil in me. Been waiting on welfare line, unemployment line, gas line since nine. Now I'm waiting on the pawn shop line. Hey, I got the devil in me. Been shot on, pushed on, gassed on, passed on, red, white, and blue on. Now I'm waiting to turn on. Hey, I got the devil in me. It's the man you see. I'm on natural black face, and up my sleeve I'm holding an ace that I won't die in disgrace. If I stop dancing and don't let you blow me any more in the wind, cause I refuse to come. Help! Rape! Rape! <laughs> Over 600,000 people died during the Civil War. After the Union victory, the process of reintegrating southern states and managing the rights and lives of newly freed slaves began. This era is known as the Reconstruction. In late 1865, the 13th Amendment was ratified, officially abolishing slavery in the United States. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated just a few short months prior to its ratification and his vice president, Andrew Johnson, became the new president. Johnson's era is known as presidential reconstruction, in which the president actively fought against rights for blacks. Johnson believed in the idea of Heron Volk democracy, which meant that the least white man should be higher than the greatest black man. The term Heron Volk itself means master race. 